My name is John, and you are watching another episode of Forward Talk, and today we have uh, a special guest with us, a good friend of mine, Nate Whitley from the Cut It Straight podcast, and uh, we are so excited to have him with us today, and uh, uh, Nate Whitley is an author, a husband, a father, a pastor, I believe a school principal too, right? Uh, uh, school pastor, teacher. Okay, I got you. Uh, but today we're going to be focusing on the uh, Nate Whitley that is a preacher. Maybe in a another conversation or so, we might focus on some other aspects of who you are. But today we want to talk specifically about preaching. Uh, thank you for joining me today on Forward Talk. It's a pleasure to have you. It's an honor to be here, and uh, let me say it's uh, uh, quite humbling to be sitting here with you, who I've admired so long. Uh, you'd be interviewing me. I should be interviewing you. So uh, it's a privilege for me to be on the board. Not, not at all, man. Thank you for thank you for being here. All right, Nathan, tell us uh, uh, your story briefly. Uh, were you raised in the church? Kind of how you met your wife? How did you know you were called to preach? And uh, just kind of what ministry looks like for you at this point? Well, I hope we have some time here, uh, but I'll try to give you the uh, abridged version. Uh, right. I grew up in church. Uh, I grew up in a United Pentecostal church. Um, my mom took me and my two older sisters to church. Um, and so uh, I grew up in Bloomington, Indiana. That's where I'm from originally. Um, and so if anybody's familiar with Bloomington, Indiana, you know that there's 50 plus apostolic churches in the Monroe County um, area. Uh, and so I grew up in one of the uh, UPC churches there. Um, and so I was just a... Um, a musician, played drums all my life. Uh, my, my life's ambition when I was younger was just to make people laugh, make my friends laugh, have a good time. Um, uh, just to kind of give you some context for that, I grew up in a home where there, my, my, my dad was an alcoholic and a smoker. He died um, of lung cancer and esophageal cancer. Uh, he was a mean drunk, um, and he was uh, mean to my mom, and not so much mean to my sisters and myself, but we, we lived on edge all the time. And then my pastor that I grew up with was, he was mean too. Um, <laughs> he, was a, um, uh, he was a mean, he just, he was, he was a mean preacher. Um, he never smiled when he was walking in the hallway or walking in the room, you hid. Yeah. Um, so, uh, we had no reprieve. Um, I had no reprieve at church or at home uh, from, you know, just negativity. And so I wanted to make people laugh. I always wanted to make the room laugh. I hated tension. I still hate tension. Um, and so I, I was always trying to make people laugh and have a good time, and make things light because I never had that. Um, so <clears throat> I, I remember we had Joel Urshan uh, preach um, youth revival for us. I was 17, 18 years old. I think I was 17. And uh, he was my age. I think he's only like a year older than me. And uh, it was amazing to see him doing that. And he sounded like an old man uh, at that, you know, at that age. Very and incredible. I was Mature yeah, preacher it's and so, so amazing. And, um, and I was just, you know, I wasn't serious about spiritual things. And, but, you know, I grew up in church, like I said, but I was leaving Sunday morning service we had with him. And um, I never claimed to hear the Lord talk to me or, you know, even, even now, I, I think there's only been a handful of times that he's spoken to me where I've, I know it's him. Uh, and I heard this thing tell me as I was pulling out going to Long John Silver's on a Sunday afternoon uh, after that that morning service at Joel Ursh and I heard something say to me you're going to be doing that one of these days yeah. I just remember just being shocked at that that thought like I knew it wasn't coming from me because it, yeah. it, it never would have come from me um, and so I, I felt that but I tucked it away never told anybody um, my mom and I left that church when I was 19 my mom spent her whole life there I spent 19 years there we left there uh, the church went through a rough patch. You know, I think people kind of got tired of the meanness um, and the negativity. It was a very legalistic preaching uh, that we grew up under. Uh, some of it was right. Some of it was wrong. Uh, I think a lot of it was done in the wrong spirit. <clears throat> and so uh, we we left there. I told my mom, if this is what heaven's going to be made up of, I don't want to go. go. Um, 
Yeah. So, and, and so I made the decision to leave there. I went to a, uh, another church, I had some friends, uh, whose dad was the pastor and it was an ALJC church. I never heard of an ALJC church. Never knew what that was. Uh, we were not just UPC only. We were that church only. Um, and that was what was taught. That so was what it, wasn't was taught. The, it wasn't just about the organization. It was about your one particular location. Yeah, and that was taught. That was taught that we were, if we went anywhere else, we'd go to hell. Um, and so that was, my mom was very fearful to leave there. Um, but she knew her boy needed to be saved. My sisters were backslid and she wasn't going to let her third child be backslid. So we left, went to an ALJC church. We kudos, we kudos to your mother. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and she realized once we made that switch, uh, that was the right thing. Mom stayed there until recently. She just moved here to Knoxville, um, about three months ago. So anyway, long story short, I'm trying to get somewhere, but <laughs> I want to have the context of my life because if you yeah. don't understand where I've come from. You don't understand where I'm at or I'm going. That's right. Um, and, and so, um, I backslid, I backslid around that time, kind of fall into the trap of, you know, you're going to follow in the footsteps of other people in your family. And so, but I still have tucked back in my mind that Sunday morning, uh, going along John Silver's where I felt that. And so about 22, I felt it again and I was running from the Lord and, um, I ran even harder. And, um, and so finally 2005 Easter, um, I prayed through, uh, there's a story all behind that. I won't, I'll, I'll spray the details. And so with that, I, um, I just knew what I was called to do. And I, it was very difficult for me to say, I feel called to preach because that was just not me. It was for, it was for me too. Even though I knew it for a long time that that was what I was supposed to do. Uh, I did not want to admit it to myself because I knew the moment I admitted it to myself, yeah, I would have to start doing it. So, yeah, well, and I knew people wouldn't believe me. I mean, I'm 15 years into this now, and I still have people back home going, you're still doing that preaching thing? And, <laughs> well, man, for me, it was just the opposite. My dad was in the fellowship that we grew up in, has been a legend for years, and so right. decades, so everybody expected that I was going to be a preacher. Well, but, I'll tell you a funny story, kind of similar to that. One of my closest friends in the world, his dad was a pastor, and we always teased him that he was going to be a preacher. You know, we were just always this yeah. you know, <laughs> and we just pre we be teasing about that. And so uh, I went with him to a, a church in Lafayette, Indiana, where he met his, it would be his soon to be uh, wife after this. He was dating her. He's like, he wanted me to go. So I went and we went and you might know this guy. Um, his name is Bobby Wade. He was a preacher. Um, he was preaching and uh, he's like, someone in this room's being called to preach. And I was just nudging my friend like, ha ah, it's you. you know? <laughs> and so then like six months later, I went back with him to his girlfriend's church. He, by this time, I think he may have been engaged and Bobby Wade was there again, just happened to be there. And I'm, again, I'm 22 and um, he gets up, he's walking down the aisle and he was kind of in the, using the gifts. He might still be, I don't know. I don't know much about him now. But he's like, somebody in this room is being called to preach. And I didn't hit him. But I was like, oh, it's, it's me. And I was <laughs> death. But so all that said, I, you know, 25, I, I prayed. I prayed through. I really, you know, I was baptized when I was younger, got the Holy Ghost when I was a kid. Um, but at that moment, that moment of repentance, it was real. It was real for me. And um, I, made a, I almost made a shipwreck of my life. And I remember... Um, uh, John, I was walking back from praying that Easter Sunday, 2005. I was walking up the aisle. I'm, I'm sure people prayed with me, but it didn't feel like it. I'm, and it was just yeah. me and uh, like a whirlwind. And I was walking back to my seat after service, and I'm trying to get choked up. But I, I, I really felt like the devil said, you'll be back. You'll, you'll always be back. And I just I made up my mind that I'll never, I'll never be back. Yeah. And, uh, and it, it, it was a war. It was a war for me to, to, to make that decision because it was just not in my nature. And so <clears throat> from there, it just, um, I think I preached my first message like three months later. I, I, sh I should say I gave a talk. Yeah. Um, and then um, about a few months after that, I preached at a, a, a youth service at another church. And then about the next year, I was preaching out almost full time. Oh, wow. That's amazing. So, so the Lord moved quickly in my life and it's not going to happen like that for everybody. And, no. um, but the Lord knew he had to do a quick work in me. Yeah. Uh, so then I, um, the church at there in Bloomington, I'm trying to give you a quick overview of how I got where I'm at. Um, 
I uh, preached out for a little while, quit my job. I worked as a nurse assistant for eight years. By this time, I was working there for six years full time. And uh, the Lord said, quit your job and go evangelize. So I went to evangelize a year later after that. And it dried up. That I did a whole summer. Uh, my dad died. My grandpa died within two weeks of each other. No one was calling me for revivals. And I thought, well, you know, I've missed God in all of this. Uh, I had to move back in with my mom. I couldn't pay my car payment. Um, I had no job and, um, I preached for a guy by the name of Tim Gill, who's oh, been wow. on the talk, um, yeah. at that time. And God put me in his, his, in his, um, in, in kind of in his path. And so, um, my old job called me back. They said, Hey, can you come back to work? They just were saying, Hey, just, just kind of by, by chance, they offered me more money. They allowed me to work four ten so I can have Fridays off so I can preach out on the weekends. Um, and then the end of that year, 2006, Pastor Gill called me and he said, could you, could you spend the month of January with me and Medora? And uh, we're going to have uh, 31 days of prayer and fasting. And I said, I, I, sure. Yeah. So he called my pastor, uh, that month turned into six months, that six months turned into nine months. Wow. Um, and so I, I worked with him. God knew I needed him in my life to, wow. to train, to, to invest in me. And, to, and then, um, Pastor John Voskis in Potts Camp, Mississippi, um, along with uh, Bishop Steve Wilson, they called me while I was there. And they, you know, uh, Brother Voskis uh, said, could you move here uh, to Mississippi and, and train here for six months and be an intern? I said, well, I feel called to evangelize still. He said, well, let's work for six months towards that. So I, I quit my job a second time, <laughs> which, was, which was much harder than the first time, you know. Oh, absolutely. First time I was very zealous. And, uh, but this time I was like, okay, I'll, I'll, I'm going to pray a little bit more. And um, felt the release. I did it. Worked there six months. I went full-time to evangelize. I did that for about three years. Met my wife at a conference that I, I played drums at. She was singing. I had a huge crush on her. For The drummer always gets the girl. Yeah, yeah, man. And uh, so, um, yeah, I met her at a conference. And we uh, started dating a few months later <coughs> and then um, got engaged. I still traveled. Her, her uh, father is Pastor Mark McCool. Her grandfather is Bishop Billy McCool. And that's where you're working in ministry currently is there. Yeah, so they asked me. I was evangelizing. We were about three months away from getting married. And they were like, you know, and I was like, um, I never wanted to pastor. Honestly, I just wanted to evangelize and preach and have revival. And um, so. Uh, and I was like, I don't want a youth pastor. I did. I worked like that at, at my home church for a while, work with youth. And I just felt like a little too old to do that. Yeah. And, uh, so I knew if they ever asked me to be a youth pastor, I was going to say no. Well, they took me to Cracker Bear after I preached on a Sunday night and they said, Hey, um, how would you like to be associate pastor at first apostolic church? And I was like, what are you, are you me? Are you kidding? You know? And, uh, so I took a month to pray and fast, got counsel. And I've been here. I'll be t here ten years um, this June. So, well, yeah. So I, I teach in the school. I teach um, uh, Bible to middle schoolers all the way through high school. Uh, we have uh, student chapel on Fridays that I preach at. Awesome. Uh, and so then at this church, we teach Bible studies, discipleship classes, and that's kind of my life in a very abridged moment. Well, that's an amazing story. Thank you for sharing that. All right. Yeah, good. <clears throat> can you uh, can you talk about the role that preaching should have in in the Christian life? Yeah, I, I um. How important is how important is preaching to the Christian experience? Well, number one, preaching is necessary for gospel conversion. Romans ten fourteen through fifteen, very familiar. Um, how then will they call on him in whom they've never? or not believed and how are they to believe in him of whom they've never heard and how are they to hear without someone preaching and how are they to preach unless they are sent so number one you have to have preaching to be converted now we might not remember the sermon or the the message or the lesson that it was that brought our conversion i don't i can't i really can't pinpoint that sermon for me but it was a lifetime of preaching yeah. Um, that, that I recalled that I knew I needed to get things right. Um, and so it, it, it plays a part that you have to have preaching to be converted. And, yeah. and that looks different for a lot of people with a Sunday school classroom or a discipleship classroom or a revival, a tent meeting or something. 
preaching somewhere along the line has played an important part to your gospel conversion. No doubt about it. Number, uh, so then number two, in the Christian life, uh, preaching is, is vital. You, you have to have preaching if you're going to be a part uh, of the Christian faith or part of the, the, the body of Christ. Um, 2 Timothy 4, 1 through 5, this is what Paul's writing to Timothy. I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word. Preach the okay, word. preach the word. Well, what's the purpose of preaching the word? He says, I be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people won't endure sound teaching. Now, the opposite of that is that there are people who are going to endure sound teaching and preaching. Yes. So for us, we have to preach. Yes, sir. Uh, you, you have to preach. You have to have preaching. Um, and, From and the preacher's you, perspective, we preach, whether, we preach whether the audience is one of those who will endure sound teaching or whether they are those who will not endure sound teaching. From our perspective, and, either, and, way, either way, we preach. Right. And you, and you have to do it when you feel like it and when you don't feel like it. That's, That's being right. in season and out of season. And man, uh, there, we both know there are times where you just simply do not feel like preaching. No. And, 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 and I like the old joke. The mother comes in, wakes her son up and says, son, you got to get up and go to Sunday school. I don't want to go to Sunday school, but you got to go to Sunday school. But I don't want to go to Sunday school. Give me one good reason why I should go to Sunday school, because you're the pastor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that there's a lot of Sundays like that in, uh, yeah, in 52, is. you know, um, if you read, I, 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 I kind of outlined this this morning early, Ephesians 4, 11 and 14, the, the role of preaching in Christianity, and he gave some apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors and teachers. What, what, what's the purpose behind those, those five offices to equip the saints for the work of ministry, building up the body of Christ until we attain the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the son of God to mature manhood, to the mature, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro. So there's six things right there. That, why uh, you need preaching? There's six uh, things why you need preaching. You need preaching to be equipped, yeah. equipped to serve ministry. And, to, and for ministry. So you have to have preaching. Okay. So number two, to be built up in the body of Christ, you have a role in the body of Christ, not just to serve, but to be a part of the body of Christ. Number three, to attain the unity of the faith. You know, Paul wrote somewhere, he goes, I've heard that there's divisions among you. Yeah. Well, preaching absolves that division and brings unity of the faith. Yes, so you sir. have to have preaching. And then you have to have the knowledge of the Son of God. Well, you can't know him more or know him better without preaching and teaching. That's right. Um, and then to maturity, he says to uh, mature to the stature of Christ. You're not trying to mature to the person sitting next to you in the pew or yeah. the person down the road who claims to be a Christian. You're trying to mature to be like Christ. So, that, okay. so that's the role of preaching. And the yeah. last, to no longer be children tossed to and fro Grow up. by every wind of doctrine. So there's six things there. Now, that's the role of preaching for, for saints. But as a preacher, we should look at our sermons and go through that checklist and make sure that our preaching is developing that in, yeah. in the body of Christ and the people of God. So, and, are you, so every sermon might be different, but it should have one of those six things from Ephesians four and 11 that you're, you're doing is serving the people in your sermons. That's it, incredible. It, it, those things. And, and growing up to the fullness of the stature of Christ, there is, there is nothing that can, bring an individual up to the stature of word made flesh right than word being preached the word is the only right. thing that can bring us up to the the stature of word made flesh the word Absolutely. is the only thing that can bring us up to the level of of word and well, that's what i think you know we're looking at both sides of this preaching is not a, a portion of a service where you're getting entertained no no and, and and for a preacher that's not a moment for you to just fill up space mm. there's purpose behind preaching there's purpose why you need to hear preaching and i that's think right. you're preaching and be a, you know be preached to um because there's there's purpose behind it it's not just something we do uh it's not just a talk it's not just that's right uh, you know uh, a speech this is preaching 
Uh, and there's a purpose behind it. I think the, those six things there should give us. Man, that's incredible. That's pause that's, to, to consider. That's beautiful. So how important uh, are good study habits to a preacher? And his first Peter. Yeah, well, first Peter five and two says to feed the flock of God. Yes. You have to feed people, but you can't feed people what you've not sown and harvested in the study. Yeah, that's right. You know, if you're going to feed the flock of God, you're going to have to sow and reap in the study. I use uh, the illustration with feeding the flock of God. Um <clears throat> With one of the cooking shows, I use an illustration with one of the cooking shows that I watched. I think it was one of the few shows that Gordon Ramsay was on. And but one of one of the uh, tests that that the cooks had to do when they were first coming onto the show was they had to blind taste ingredients mm. and blindfolded. They had to taste ingredients and identify what, what the ingredients were. Right. But to develop their palate. Some of them got it spot on. Some of them were way off. Yeah. And so in feeding others, that implies that you have on some level prepared the food. And the problem is, is that a lot of preachers are cooking with ingredients they haven't tasted. Right. They're, they're trying to work with ingredients that they're not familiar with. Right. And so to feed the flock of God, that preacher has to be familiar with the ingredients that he's working with and i think that takes time it does i mean i'm going on 15 years of of preaching and i feel like i'm just now starting to finally grow yeah. in 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 the word of god um but you know <laughs> spiritual hunger can only be satiated with spiritual truths that's right you know, and just like physical hunger, you know, I have a, I have a four-year-old little girl and, you know, she, when she's hungry, you know, she's like, well, I want, I want ice cream or I want some Reese cups. Well, that's going to be good for a moment. Yes. It's not going to be enough to, 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 you know, to really get rid of that hunger pain. And so you have, to, it's the same thing spiritually. You can't give people spiritual junk food. No. You know, you're going to have to, you're going to have to give them the meat and the milk of God's word so they can grow. And so you studying, know. studying makes us familiar with the ingredients. Absolutely. Studying, studying makes us, I can, I, as a preacher, when someone's preaching, I can detect the flavors of oneness. Oh even, yeah. Even when the sermon isn't about oneness, I can, oh, yeah. I can taste those flavors of oneness theology. Oh, even yeah. when, even when the sermon isn't specifically about right. grace or the gospel, I can, I can taste those, those notes of the gospel in a sermon, even yeah. when it's not the primary, uh, the primary thing that's, that's being de delivered. And so a preacher needs to, through study, through personal devotion, reading the word of God, become familiar with what it is that he's feeding. And if he's right. not, then he's not going to know what the proper balance is. If you, if you don't, if you don't, you haven't tasted the ingredients, you can put way too much of something in it yep. because you don't know the impact that it has as on the food. And so like you were talking about earlier with the harshness of the pastor that uh, you grew up with and many, many of us have grown up under, I certainly grew up under that same type of atmosphere. Um, but w w being familiar with the ingredients allows us to put the right amount Right. that ingredient into our preaching. And so we'll know the impact that that has upon the overall flavor of what it is that we are feeding the people of God. Well, I think, it, you know, he says, feed the flock. Well, you need, uh, if you're, I'm, I'm speaking specifically to pastors, you're going to know what your flock needs yeah. to grow. That's exactly you know, right. And you're going to know what they're hungry for. Um, and, and that's, you know, I, I used to love um, high energy, um, exuberant preaching. Yeah. The kind that makes you shout and, and run and dance. And I thought that was, to me, early on, I thought that was the, the pinnacle of great preaching. But it's like an energy drink. It is. You know, as, as I'm drinking one right now, it's like an energy drink where you're, you're going to get a high, but you're going to crash. Yeah, it is. So, you know, and, and but sustained Christians are built by Bible saturated preaching and teaching. Absolutely. And if you're 
if you're not spending time in God's word, and that's why I'm, it's kind of a hobby horse. We'll talk about pet peeves at the end here, but getting your sermons from YouTube and, and podcasts, it's not sustainable. It's no, just it, you, because you're going to have to keep going back and it's not going to, you know, after a while, your people are going to say, well, if I can, if, if that's all you're giving me, I'll go I down. Can. Yeah, yeah I, can, I, can I can listen to that podcast too. I can. Yeah, I'll download it. I don't need to come here. Exactly, you and know, I certainly so, don't need to tithe for you to preach to me what I can get off of a podcast for free. Yeah, exactly. You know, it's exactly. so uh, it's not sustainable. And I think that's why, and it's hard. Listen, studying is hard. It is, it, and and that's the reason why the Bible phrases it as uh, that elders are worthy of double honor, especially those who labor, labor. in word, right. That they, they it's, who it's, labor in word. And, it's, and it it's always, crack, it always cracks me up when somebody says, you know, that, that preacher needs to get a real job. You know, it's like <laughs> you, you've evidently never labored through studying a text of scripture. If you don't think that, and, and and for some preachers, that's true because they they don't work, they don't labor in their calling. But for that, a preacher who labors, do I? And, it's, and it shows. It does. And for preachers who labor in the word, that labor in 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 the word of God, it's it, and that shows too. You you Absolutely. can know very well by listening to a preacher whether or not he's actually working his job, whether oh, yeah. he's actually putting in the effort to do it properly. Well, you know, I study every day. I, I study every day. I, I read every day. I write every day, even if I'm not preaching. So, so for instance, so here at the school, uh, I teach Bible three, two, yeah, three times a week. And then on Mondays, I do a devotional with all the school. And then Fridays, I preach almost every Friday. I split it. I, I, my brother-in-law, um, Anthony McCool, he does some of the preaching on Fridays as well. But at the church, um, I preach every third Sunday or so. How that kind of falls, I split that with with pastor. Um, but even if I'm preaching that week, I'm studying yeah. every day because I, I just I don't I don't study to preach. I study to know the word. Yeah. And so then the preaching. Kind of a, is an overflow from from the study, and that's and you know and that's hard to do because I'm not inspired to you know, preach the word and be instant in season and out of season. Well, you got to study season, in season and out of season too. You ain't kidding. There's sometimes I don't want to do it, but I know it's so beneficial um, to my people, to my kids, um, to my life. I, I've, I've got I've got to labor the word of God. Absolutely. So uh, how important do you think sermon preparation is to good preaching? Not just, not just the study habits of, okay, I'm studying the Word of God, I'm reading devotionally, I'm doing uh, those kinds of things as a Christian, but when it actually comes time to laying out a sermon, preparing a sermon, writing a sermon, whatever that looks like for the individual preacher, I write mine out completely word for word, every, every sermon, every Bible class. Anybody could take my notes and read my notes, and it would be a completely coherent message. But not everybody's like that. But whatever the level of preparation is, whatever the style of sermon prep is, how important is that to, to good preaching? Um, I, I, it's invaluable. I mean, I can't, you can't put a price tag on it, or you can't, you can't put a time limit on it as well. Like someone said, well, how long do you, do you, take to write a sermon or study for a sermon or prepare a sermon you know it's 15 years now of of you know of studying to to get one sermon you know and the more the and i i used to hate this but it's true i'm finding it true now is that you know the, the more you do it the more experience you have yeah uh, the better it's going to be and the easier it's going to be for you to prepare you speak man John, it, it, I remember stressing myself out when I evangelized. Um, what am I going to preach? You know, I, I mean, I'd be sick. What am I going to preach? And yeah. trying to, and then, then my reading the Bible was a slave to getting a sermon. And it wasn't, it wasn't fruitful. It was, oh God, what am I going to preach? And give me something, Lord, give me something. Well, 
I, I stopped doing that and just began to study to, to, to study. Yeah. And, um, but for me, it looks different. It depends on, on when it is and where it is. Yeah, so, exactly right. so let me just, let me, do, let me break it to in two ways. So for instance, on Fridays when I do our elevate student chapel here at the school, I do a series. I am a series preacher. Me too. Uh, that, on Sundays. Uh, yeah. Sometimes and so I have Wednesday series going in a Sunday series. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I've got a Monday morning series and I got my Bible study series going in, the, in my classes because for me, if I'm constantly scrambling, trying to find out what I'm going to teach and preach, I'm going to be in trouble and it's not going to be fruitful. No, um, really. And so I've got to be organized. So when I start a series, I know in the summertime, in the summertime, uh, I'm getting ready for the, for, for the fall. I've got a series in mind. I've already got next year's in mind already. I'm going to do the armor of God wow. um, next year. So I've already, I'm getting all my resources together. I've already got my outline uh, I've, I'm in, kind of just penciled in. So when I start, I know where I can go. I know yeah. Monday morning I'm going, to, I'm going to start getting ready for Friday. Um, and I know I'm going to do like, so this year it's been kind of different because it's just been up and down. Um, but it's, but next year I know for sure it's going to be that, um, the armor of God. So I'll know, Hey, I'm going to start with, you know, the helmet or the, the, the sword of the spirit. And that way I'm organized and I'm, I'm planning. So what I try to do, if I'm preaching to kids, I've, I've already got in mind what I'm, how I'm going to apply it to them. Yes. And so I keep that, you know, Haddon Robinson wrote a book on um, biblical preaching or Bible preaching. Can't remember what it's called, but his whole, his whole thesis is you should be able to summarize your sermon in one sentence. Uh -huh. So that's helped me immensely. Um, yeah. I try to do that as I'm, so I'm thinking about my kids. I'm thinking about um, who I'm, because I teach, I preached from five-year-olds to 18-year-olds on Fridays. Yeah. So I have a wide, I have a wide range of ages. So I got to make sure that I can be able to summarize that in a very short sentence. So as I'm studying, you know, say the, the, the armor of God, whatever piece it might be, I'm, I'm thinking that sentence in mind. Yeah. Um, and then I'm, I'm writing an outline. So for instance, so let me, if I do like a Sunday night here, um, which, you know, uh, those one-off sermons for me now, after I've uh -huh. been doing this for so long are the, are the hardest to do. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Because I, but what I've been doing, um, is been using what I do on Fridays. I'll, I'll preach it again to the church on Sundays. Yeah. Um, and so that way I'm, I'm helping myself and, and then I can, I can kind of mold it into that. So let me just go back and just kind of look into that um, Ephesians 4, 11 through 14. This morning, as I was reading that, I thought, man, there's a sermon outline right there. But that little, that little section, you know, it would be difficult to preach all of that section, those four verses in one sermon. It'd be very difficult to do. But I, if I could do a series on that little, you know, little Absolutely. section, Absolutely. you know, I can, I can start with that, what we call the fivefold ministry and go through those. And that would be really beneficial. Yeah, but those, those, those on, on the equipping of the saints, you can do a whole absolutely, class. and and so that creates a, you know, that's six weeks of Bible class is just absolutely on the focus of and the purpose of preaching and what preaching accomplishes. And, and 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 for me, I'm just thinking to myself when guys tell me they don't know what to preach, I'm thinking. I don't know. I it, I got the I got too much. What are you <laughs> What are you I've doing as much. a preacher that you don't know what to preach? That you don't have any. I've preaching. got. I mean, I, right here, I'm looking at that this morning. I'm going. I'm saving that, and I'm I'm going to work on that just for me. Even if I never preach it, I mean, that's that's some stuff. That's right. And so I so that's fun. you know. So that's where I'll start and and kind of go through that, um, pulling down commentaries, dictionaries, handbooks, sermons. Um, sermon books, whatever I can find to help kind of fill in those, 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 those outlines, those bullet yep. points. Absolutely. Uh, and um, that's great advice. And so for young preachers that are watching and listening, you need to, to cover the last two questions. You need to uh, develop really good personal study habits and you need to develop a discipline of writing and preparing what you are going to speak to the people of God. And not just do it for the for the next thing, right? I've I've written entire series series of sermons and stuff that 
that I haven't even preached yet, written oh, yeah. stuff that I that I haven't even gotten to yet, but I've developed it out and I've worked through it. And there's something about writing it out like you and I do word for word that you are fleshing yep. out those concepts <laughs> that just puts that embeds that so deeply into your spirit that, that when you're up there preaching, it just flows out. And so it's like you say, it's, it's, uh, it's, you can't, you cannot measure, um, uh, the necessity and the importance of, of good study habits and good sermon preparation. Kind of going off of that, looking back how I used to preach. So how I used to, when I evangelized, um, I would, so this is just kind of just how I did it. When I was evangelizing, uh, I'd get up early in the morning. I still get up early in the morning. So I'd get up early. So because sometimes I'd preach three and four and five times a week. Um, and it was really, really hard because I really wasn't that good or that experienced. <laughs> so I had to study because I just, I'm not that good. Um, and thank God for his grace, you know, to, to get me through that. But I'd get up early and start, start studying. Um, and then I would try to memorize at least my, my bullet points, or my, at least my, my outline. And I had guys going, I can't believe you would memorize that. Yeah, that's blasphemy that you would try to memorize your sermon. Well, I'm like, I'm not that good. I, and I'm not extemporaneous. I, I am not. That's why I have all my, you sent me these so I could write them out. Because I'm just, my mind doesn't work. I'm not a good, um, I probably would never be a good debate guy. Because I'm just not quick with my, I, it takes me a while. To, I love to debate, debate style conversation too. But Yeah, you're in, not like you. And so, um, so I have to write it out. And I realized too. Um, a few years ago, when I got away from my notes, that's when I started getting into my opinion and personal preferences and grinding axes. And I got really tired of myself. I, I was really hard on myself. I got, I, I'd go back and listen. I go, man, that was, that was bad. Oh, that, was scary. that was terrible. Yeah. And so I thought I'm sticking to my notes. I write out everything. Cause I, I, I do like you, I do it word for word because I'm going to use it later on my blog. Exactly. Um, and then I might use it for a book chapter and or, then if I want to, or it's going to be a, it's going to be a body of work that you can pass to your kids. Yeah. Or if I, if I want to go back and preach it later, I know what I said, you know, or, exactly. Or I can go back and say, you know, 10 years from now, look back at that and say, uh, man, this is what I was thinking a decade yeah. ago. <laughs> yeah. And so it's invaluable for so many reasons to work your way through those those, yeah, those messages and those ideas on paper, fully fleshing, fleshing them out. And so, yeah, that's, Absolutely. That, that's incredible. How important, um, what kind of priorities should preachers put on reading? It, it, I'm just going to say this up front before you answer. It's always staggering to me. It's always flabbergasting, stunning to me whenever I recommend a book to a preacher and, it, and he looks at me and says, well, man, I, man, I'm not, I'm not a reader. Uh, I, I'm, I'm not a reader. I'm like, I heard, I, yeah, I heard John Voskis, who is a, you need to have him on forward talk. He's one of the great, he's one of the greatest minds in our movement. Um, he's a scholar and um, great. One of the best preachers I've ever heard my entire life. He's had incredible a profound influence on me. Um, and you want to talk about sermon thoughts. He's got them, but, he said one time, he said, um, I wrote it down. Uh, he said, when a preacher says they don't read, I can't begin to tell you how unenthused I am to hear them preach. <laughs> exactly. And uh, that's stuff. Be, I would be really, it would be really hard for me if I, if I knew a preacher, you know, did not put that kind of effort into into the, into the word of God, into his occupation. I just. But what, it, what it does is. It creates, um, uh, you're going to preach the same thing over and over again. You might, you might give it a different yeah. title and you might pull it from a different text. That's exactly you're right. Gonna preach, you're going to preach the same thing. You're going to use the same illustrations. That's what right. reading does is um, uh, reading gives li life and vitality to your preaching. Yeah. It increases your vocabulary. It increases uh, the use of illustrations when you need them. Um, uh, I heard Doug Wilson, one of my favorite authors, uh, he said, read until your brain creaks. Yeah. Uh, and I've, I've, take, <clears throat> I've taken that uh, to myself. I want to read as much as I possibly can. This year, I'm kind of, well, over the last three or four months going into this year, or including this year, at the end of last year, 
Um, I've not been reading a whole lot of theology or uh, books, um, biblical-based books. I'm reading some commentaries and uh, some handbooks as I'm doing this daily devotional thing that I'm working on. Uh, but, but for the most part, um, uh, I've been reading a lot of psychology and history, nonfiction books on leadership. Um, I love fiction. Uh, so I've been reading a lot of that over the last probably three to four months. And I can't tell you how uh, beneficial it's been for me. Um, and I love reading all those other books, but I, I felt myself getting stagnant reading so much theology and reading, yeah. uh, you know, biblical studies books. And I love that stuff. Um, but it was really, I, I, I wasn't at getting as inspired as I had been. I thought yeah. I need to take a break. And so I've been reading some like Malcolm Gladwell, Jordan Peterson's book, 12 rules for life. Yeah. Uh, that's, um, atomic habits by James clear. Um, I read Malcolm Gladwell's, uh, uh, David and Goliath. Man, uh, such a such cool know, concepts in there. Oh my gosh! And then I went back and did Outliers again. Yeah, um, I do a lot of audio books, so I've been listening to a lot. Um, and I just realized, man, it's really helped. I me mean, reading a lot of books on writing. Uh, that's kind of where I'm at, and I feel like it's helping me. You know, preaching is is communicating and i think you have to be able to listen to good communicators and read good yeah. communicators uh and reading good that. communicators it will help you to communicate better when you write absolutely well so if you know what good writing is then it will help you to be a good writer and so in reading too like read good stuff read yes. good material good don't just read twitter and facebook and espn.com exactly right read good yeah. stuff the last, the last fiction stuff that I read is I, and I'm really late to the game, but this was maybe a year or so ago, maybe a year or two ago that I read through the Chronicles of Narnia. Yeah. That's on uh, my short list. And, uh, but that's the last fiction stuff I've read. What I'm like devouring right now is, is every book I can get my hands on about Sola Scriptura. And so that's the, yeah, like the yeah. theology phase that I'm in right now. So well, I finished, uh, I didn't, I, I don't know if you saw any of the video that I, my last episode of Ford yeah. talked about with, uh, applying Antonin Scalia to hermeneutics. Oh yeah, man. Oh yeah. Well, but, it's, it, for fiction, I, um, and I know there's some who are probably watching this getting, <laughs> getting ready to turn me off right now. That's all right. We don't um, care. I read three or four volumes of, um, Harry Potter. Oh, uh, and man, it, it is awesome. Um, Absolutely. And then I read. Uh, uh, what's her name? Uh, Rowling, J.K. Rowling. Yeah, she's she's fantastic writer. When you and read, that, but when you listen to her though, she will say that her her struggle with faith is what informed every bit of of her writing the Harry Potter series. And well, she she claims that C.S. Lewis and and Tolkien were her inspirations. And you she know, actually her, says, if you know the gospel, you know the story of the Bible, then then you will yeah. recognize it all through through her books and it's the exact same genre as it's the, as, it's the, as Lewis yeah. and Tolkien and and those guys yeah I, I read the Hobbit and uh Lord of the Rings a couple of years ago and I mean I need to go back and finish that that series yeah man I, I've I've seen preachers I've seen preachers just like get on like a, a number of years ago they were on a just a kill Harry Potter you know, just but they'll but then they'll turn around and read um, the book of Left <laughs> or Left Behind, which is the I think is the scourge of our eschatology. It really uh, is. It's and, it's uh, atrocious theology. It's terrible. But but you know, to, to each his own. Yeah, and we'll talk about that in a moment about those things. But yeah, <laughs> fix. You know, I think reading widely is beneficial for preachers. Oh, you know, no. because Here's my thing too. Um, I think one of my one of the most underrated preachers in our movement, and I think he is, to me, in my opinion, one of the the best that we've got is Ken Gurley. And if you listen oh, to Ken Gurley, communicator. I mean, he just blows me away with all. Well, this we were stuff. at uh, Motion. We saw each other at Motion. I think two years ago. Yeah, man. Man, that was my first real introduction to Ken Gurley preaching. My God, his communication skills are incredible. I mean, he, 
So I went again this year to motion and um, he preached the last night, brother. He, he, he talked about the wind is blowing and they started playing that. And he just, he is the master of illustrations. Yeah. Him and J.H. Osborne are the masters uh, of illustrations and he can just pull things in and they're going, it just, he he's captivating. Well, he's not doing that without reading, you know, no, he's it, not. There's, you know him and J.H. Osborne are not going to be, they're not doing that without reading. No. Uh, and you know, and Paul tells it, Timothy to give attendance to reading. Yes. Bring the books, bring the parchments. And so it is part of our job description to ask preachers to read. It's, it's well, think about, uh, think about this. Our source from preaching for preaching is words. It's, it's a the written, and it was given originally uh, uh, orally. It was, it was yeah. spoken, but then it was written. And so it's all compiled together in words, sentences, paragraphs, and books. You have to and we are you have you have to be able you to have do to it. engage with writing, you have to engage with written material, books, you have to engage with language, syntax, grammar, all of that stuff. If you're if going you to don't want to if you don't want to do that, don't be a do preacher. Something. Don't go do something else. Do something. I'm, do I mean, something I'm, else. I'm serious about that. Don't be a preacher. If you don't want to study, if you don't want to read, I mean, okay, if you don't like reading, get an audible subscription and listen. That's exactly that, right. Engage with material, though. I mean, I mean, don't. Well, I, I just don't. Then what do you do? Exactly. I mean, my, I just, it'd be like a, it'd be like a baseball player showing up to spring training and saying, "Well, I'm, I, I don't really hit, I don't really hit baseballs." But <laughs> yeah, I, I just it, it baffles me. It baffles me. And here's the other, the flip side of that. Uh, I've had places have me come in and and teach on preaching and and talk to young guys. And there's always, there always, it never fails. There's always somebody in the room who'll go, now, Brother Whitley, <coughs> I think we should, we should study, but we need to be people of prayer. Well, listen, I agree. We need to be people of prayer, but prayer does not replace studying. It and studying does. doesn't replace prayer. It's, it goes prayer, hand prayer, in hand. Prayer doesn't do what study is supposed to do, and study <laughs> doesn't do what prayer is supposed to do. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, and Paul I, said to Timothy, uh, study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman needeth not to be ashamed. Rightly dividing the word of truth. Yeah. Rightly dividing the word of truth does not come through prayer. It does not come through fasting. It is not. No. Rightly dividing the word of truth is not cutting it straight. Is right. Not, is not one of the nine spiritual gifts. <laughs> right. You don't fast to do that. You don't pray to do that. You have to study to right. rightly divide the word of truth. What? Study prayerfully, yes. Yes. But you well, have to study. Prayer and fasting gives your study anointing and lets you be to discern and to be led of the spirit. Because when you when you are studying, sometimes I'm studying, I'm shoving stuff in my brain and in my heart that I may never use in a sermon. But as the Holy Ghost moves, if I've, if I've been prayerful and fasting, I could be preaching. All of a sudden, God will bring. He, he said this. Jesus said, "He goes, I'll bring the Holy Ghost to bring these things to mind." And so it. You, but you, listen, He can't bring things to mind if you don't put it there. I believe. I believe that's exactly right, and I believe that on a certain level, that's how the gifts of the Spirit operate. Um, specifically, a, a word of wisdom or a word of a word of knowledge. God can, in a moment, bring back a text of Scripture. And you can speak a prophetic, a, a spiritual Absolutely. word to someone through a nugget of truth that you may never preach. Yeah. But that, that word, literal, the word of God could be a word from God for someone. Right. Well, I mean, he's not going to bring to remembrance what you've not put in your mind. He, can't, he cannot. He won't. He will not. Won't in a very Southern accent. <laughs> he will not. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, actually, I'm going to skip one or two of these. Uh, like, I'm going to skip um, the next question. Okay. And I'm going to go to question number seven, okay. and uh, and just uh, talk to you about how diligent preachers should be about keeping their preaching contextually sound. And uh, I don't know how comfortable you are with me putting a uh, a kind of a real illustration on yeah. this yeah. Uh, with a real situation that happened in a 
a conference a few years ago. And if you want to completely ignore it, then you completely ignore it or whatever. Listen, brother, I get, listen, I get dragged online for, for anything. So I'm, I'm cool with it, man. <laughs> okay. So, so at a youth conference a few years ago, I'll try to leave it as anonymous as possible, but yeah, most yeah. people are going to know what I'm talking about. Uh, and this is not to, this is, I promise, this is not to argue about the rightness or wrongness of the particular topic, just the rightness or right. the, the appropriate nature of how the, the particular preacher got there. Right. Uh, he was preaching about, uh, he, you know, I think your gift of, uh, your gift, you have a spiritual gift that's in operation here that you know where I'm about to go. With. I think, I think, I think so. So preaching against original apostolics or about original apostolics shaving. And he, he went to Leviticus about the leper covering his upper lip as proof that when you cover your upper lip with a mustache, then that's a sign of, of spiritual leprosy. It's a sign of sin in a person's life. And it was in front of 5,000 apostolic kids and the place is going nuts. And, and later on it, it's being praised as this masterpiece of preaching. <laughs> and so how much, how much accountability should we, should there be in how we handle scripture? Now, the, Facial hair, the rightness or wrongness of that, completely aside. Right. We can both agree. I think everybody can agree that that's willing to think about this honestly, that that was an absolute distortion of that text from Leviticus. And mm -hmm. how seriously do you think we should, we should take that, those kinds of abuses of context? Um, so let me give you some background. Um, I went back to school a few years ago and got my bachelor's degree in biblical studies, hermeneutics, from Indiana Wesleyan University. Um, and I'm I was, working on a very similar. I'm working on a very similar program at Regent University right yeah. now. It's. Um, I was. I'm very serious about it. Um, about knowing God's word and rightly dividing the word of truth. Um, there's some people, um, that have had a profound influence in my life for this, for this, um, this passion for, for, for the Bible, Tim Gill, obviously pastor Tim Gill, John Vasquez, Steve Pixler. Um, yeah. I think we both can, I mean, he put me on a tremendous influence on my preaching. Uh, I mean, I mean, just I, he put me on a trajectory of expository preaching. Me too. Um, Philip Harrelson, Barnabas Blog. Yeah. Uh, I mean, just there's some guys that were um, that have just had a profound influence on me, um, and at that that sent me to the book to to read it and to know it. Uh, Bishop M. L. Walls, who is Tim Gill's father-in-law, which yep. I recommend everyone to download his his commentaries and books that are available on Amazon. Let me, let me give you um, what kind of started it for me. <clears throat> I was with Bishop Walls in Africa. He was our world missions director for the Assemblies of the Lord Jesus Christ. I was evangelizing, and he asked me um, if I wanted to go to Africa. We were checking out a work there. We are going to do crusades. He was going to teach during the day, and I would do the crusades at night. And so I was very, you know, just very humbled by that opportunity. And so I was very close to, to him and his family and his wife when she was alive, and he called her on the phone. We were on our way to this, this village where we'd have no electricity. We went there and we'd preach and uh, no electricity. And so he had a, a cell phone that was available. To, it was in 2008, 2009. I can't remember. I think it's 2008. And um, <clears throat> so he had an opportunity to call her. So he called her and he was telling her like, Hey, Nate's going to preach this crusade tonight. And she goes, Oh, I'm praying for him. And I said, I said, well, uh, tell her, I said, we're two or three. Uh, I said, touching, touching, touching anyone thing. And he's on the phone with her and he goes, he turns around and he snaps at me. He goes, do you even know what that means? Goes, it doesn't. And so, um, so he, and I just, and Bishop, uh, Tim Gill, he, Brother Gill, he just laughs about that. Says, because I thought you're right. I've used that and I've heard that and it's not. So he, he, he told me what it meant. 
And so <clears throat> I wanted to be right uh, biblically. And, and when Paul, we distort context, we distort God. The word is God. And absolutely. When, when we, when we misrepresent scripture, we're misrepresenting God. And I think we need to take it as a movement. We need to take it so much more seriously than what we do, even in a simple context, like what you're illustrating. It is important to know what the Bible meant by that when it said it. And one that I've preached on, of course, I've, I preach a message called investing in my own mercy. And, um, and I, I use the verse given and shall be given unto you good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. And we, every conference, you know, it's, it's an offering scripture. That text has zero to do with zero. money. No, that's in my notes zero. later. In this, yeah. <laughs> has nothing to do with money. It has to do with forgiveness and mercy and judgment and condemnation. Well, here's, here's as preachers, we are models for our sayings and how we approach scripture. That's right. So, so if we get up and we take something out of context, we we're, we're showing that to, to God's people that you can be frivolous with his word too. My, absolutely. And, and so that's where we get, well, this is what this text means to me. Well, does God don't care what this text means, means to, you. to you. He wants to know, he wants you to know what that text meant to him. Right. And so, um, I think I think we need to be exegetically sound when Absolutely. we're preaching. And again, it goes back to a few questions ago. That takes study and effort. It does. You can um, you cannot be a good exegete if you are not studying and you are not reading and you are not preparing. It will it will mess you up. It will. It, it will mess it will mess you up. It will mess previous sermons that you've preached up yeah, because there are sermons I can't preach anymore. Absolutely. Can't do it. Sermon, I can't. Um, good preaching. <laughs> yeah. In the sense yeah. of, you know, what we well, of what we consider. Yeah. But um, I can't preach them anymore because it's just not true. And I, and here's the thing, too. You're going to, I think we, we said this earlier, you're going to discern um, when something, you know, you're going to, I, you know, you're going to be, I'm not so sure. I, heard, so I was at a camp one time. And this guy got up, his fiery guy, and he was trying to dismiss the charismatic movement like we always try to do. We've been trying to do that for 60 years now. And, um, but we like to be considered their population, though, right? We like to say, well, Pentecost is on the rise. We like that part. We like to be part of that, those numbers. But, yeah, but we don't like to be a part of the rest of it. Yeah, but count us in that number. Of, okay, but anyway, that's just, I'm sorry about that. But you can erase it later. But um, – isn't that amazing? We'll get up and we'll talk about that and we'll brag Pentecost about Those are the fastest growing. And then, we'll, and then we'll turn it. And so, so this guy got up and he was trying to dismiss why they have, you know, the Holy Ghost. And so he said, well, the, um, when the children of Israel came out of uh, Egypt, he said the cloud, the pillar of cloud was already in Egypt. But when they came out, it turned to fire. And I thought, well, first of all, that's not right. Yeah. That the pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire didn't show up. They both showed up together after they were. It's like, and you're going, you know, and people are going crazy and people turn around looking and go, oh, that's, that's good stuff. I'm going, that's, no. not, that's not even right. That's not even historically correct. And, uh, and it, bother, it, it, it will bother you. It will, it, it should, because. Yeah, you know this is God's word, and we we can't you know just do with it what we want, um, because we're going to have to give account for every word that we speak, and we're going to have to give account for what we preach to our people. That's right. Um, and I think one, th I think the, the the thing we have to do is spend time knowing God's word in the context, yeah, um, and make sure that we're we're we're, you know, there's one interpretation, but there could be multiple applications. That's right. That's right. And, and so one time, I think that's what we try to do. We try to do the opposite. We try to say, well, there's many interpretations in one application no. when really there's just one interpretation. That's right. Uh, and, and, uh, and if we do that, we make ourselves just as guilty of, as those 
who deny Acts 2.38, they'll say, well, that was just for the Jews. That's so a, when they say that, we're, whoa, 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 we can't, we, that's not right, because the same thing happened with the Samaritans, the same oh, thing happened with the Gentiles. Exactly. And so, but, so, so we become just as guilty when we say, well, that means that for that. And when, we got to be careful because you really do. Uh, if you're going to do, if you're going to do it for one, you got to do it for all. I, th um, I think, I think perhaps the greatest danger in making excuses for that kind of stuff is, is the un unintended consequence that uh, happens in the conscience of particularly the next generation of, of young people growing up in the church and for people who come in from the world who are hearing our preaching. So in one breath, I'm telling you that Leviticus is talking about a guy having a mustache. Yeah. Or uh, I'm telling you that that press down, shaking together, running over is means means if you give ten dollars in this offering, you're gonna God's gonna bless you with a thousand at some point in the future. The big problem with that is is right alongside making dogmatic statements about verses like that that are such obvious abuses of context. And then in the same sermon, I'm preaching to you, you have to repent, be baptized in Jesus' name, and receive the Holy Ghost. And what they're going to do is they're going to hear all of that together, and they're mm -hmm. going to say, if you were so obviously wrong about what you said about Leviticus and Luke and whatever other text you may have used, then there's no way I can trust what you're telling me about Acts 2.38. And, and yeah. the gospel is incredibly hindered by that kind of, that kind of preaching. And I think we need to take it serious if for that reason alone, if for no other. Well, I think the phone ringing in the background, I'm sitting here cool. <laughs> in the church. Sanctuary. But the, uh, I think what it does too, um, it makes us look unlearned. It does. Um, so, you know, and I think we've done this to ourselves. We've put such great emphasis on the spirit, which yes. we should have. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and put such little emphasis on education. Um, so when people come from other denominations and they get baptized, and they get the Holy Ghost, um, they hear it. They're going to say, now, listen, now that yeah. doesn't, that's not right. And so then what happens to us, we're, we, we get defensive. Yeah. Well, you know, and it's, 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 it's kind of intellectually dishonest. Yeah, uh, and, and we and it's not spiritual not to be. Uh, it's not spiritual to be ignorant. Ir ignorance no. is not spirituality. Log My people are destroyed lack of knowledge. Yeah, that's right. Logos is essential to the very nature of God, and so reason and and logic and uh, uh, intelligent conversation about the Word of God is spiritual in and of itself. And so I think we need to, to break down that, that false idea that we have that to study, to be prepared, to be informed, to be educated is somehow carnal and not spiritual. Nothing could be more spiritual than a proper uh, presentation of God's holy word. Nothing can be more spiritual than that. A couple things with that is, you know, we've put, sometimes we want to make people leave their their brains and their cars as they come into the sanctuary that's right you know and you know god fills our hearts with the holy ghost but he says through paul he says be renewed in the spirit of your mind that's right so he doesn't fill your brain he fills your heart it's yeah. up to us to get our thinking right that's right uh, mind being you you know yeah. to get the mind of christ is it takes effort you know the holy ghost will teach us but he's the the greatest thing that the Holy Ghost has ever taught us is he's speaking through this book. Oh, dude. I mean, uh, that is that a five WM? No, it's a, uh, it's the, uh, it's the, the Allen ESV, uh, L put. Okay. Large print, it, has that, it has that yap like the five W. Oh, yeah. oh yeah. Dude. I knew it was an Allen. I just, I oh, wasn't yeah. quite I love sure. it. Oh dude. That's a, so you're a legit preacher now. I mean, hey, I'm trying, I'm just trying to keep up with you, man. You're a legit preacher now. I'm just kidding. But yeah, man, it's <clears throat> it's so important that that we represent scripture the way that God intended for it to be represented. And I think and, going to your next question. Actually, uh, actually, can we 
are you willing to come back and do uh, another episode and a part two of this with me at a different time? Yeah. We're already in almost an hour and 15 minutes oh, wow. for this. And it doesn't, I know it doesn't feel like it, but I just looked up at my wow. clock. So are you okay with us doing a part two uh, yep. of, this, of this conversation? And yep. we, what we will do is we will pick up questions eight through eight through 13 in the, in the next episode. Okay. That'd be great. Um, and that, that'll, that'll be awesome. That way we're not doing a two and a half hour, <laughs> uh, a two and a half hour episode here. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Bro, man, it has been a pleasure today. Thank you so much. I'm going to start using this. The, you'll, you're the first person that I'm going to use this line with. Thank you for joining, joining me today in reversing the silence with forward talk. And so, dude, it was a pleasure to have you on, on the, uh, on forward talk today. Thank you for uh, being willing to, to talk about these issues and we will pick it up. We'll schedule a time to where we can pick this up and do part two and work our way through the rest of these questions. Absolutely. Man, it's an honor. Thank you for having me on here today. And I thank you for all that you're doing uh, through this platform. It's so beneficial and we need more of it. Real so, quick, um, shout out your shout out. Do you, you happen, would you happen to have a copy of your book? I don't, but you can go to Amazon or iBooks, uh, the lost art of spiritual disciplines. Incredible um, book. Please go get it, buy it, read it. Uh, go to, uh, you can go there and do that. Um, cut it straight. Podcast is for young ministers or all leaders, go whoever wants to listen to. Go subscribe to his podcast. If you have not subscribed to YouTube, uh, to my YouTube channel, Forward Talk, it, you're obviously watching this video if you're hearing me say this. So hit the subscribe button, hit the notification bell. And as soon as you're done with that, go, go to uh, Cut It Straight and subscribe to uh, Pastor Nate Whitley's um, podcast. It's, it's amazing stuff. Do you want to talk about the upcoming book that, you are, that you're yeah. working on now? Or do you want to yeah. uh, wait until, until you're closer to publication? I should have, I, I'm hoping it'll be done and printed by the end of March. So if we so do it 60 seconds, tell them what your next book is and what they can be anticipating in that. So we talked about it earlier. I teach and preach on Fridays here at our school, Apostolic Christian School. I did a series called I Am uh, Studies and the Seven I Am Declarations of Jesus Christ. Uh, so I put all of those sermons, I edited them and rewrote them all into book form. And uh, it should be available at the end of this March. Um, so be following me. You can go to my website, nswhitley.com. Subscribe there. Subscribe to Cut It Straight. Follow me on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and get updates. And uh, hopefully be out by the end of March, if not by the 1st of April. Man, I apologize that I haven't gotten back with you on any of that information yet uh, in terms of reading it or feedback. I am going to do that. Uh, and uh, But I'm... Obviously, you know what it's like to, uh, to be in school full time. I'm pastoring full time. Got it just recently, a uh, new family. Yeah. So things are kind of packed right now, but I am going to work my way through it and, uh, and be giving you some um, uh, feedback on, on that book. Oh, so I appreciate please it. forgive me at this point for oh, giving it back to you. Yeah. Thank you, bro. I love you. I appreciate you. You're an incredible preacher, a great writer, and uh, glad you're my friend. So thanks for coming on forward talking. Honored, buddy. Thank you. I'm looking forward to the next time. All right, man. God bless. Yeah.